We are ready to kick off our KSD leadership team retreat today, and we are excited to come together, be able to learn from one another, um, hear our opening kickoff speech from Dr. Watts, and later this morning, welcoming Dr. Mike Schmoker here to Team KSD. So this is a day of uh, culmination of a lot of work that began in April. That's right, April. <laughs> Um, we, uh, I want to recognize the people that came together on the leadership advisory to begin brainstorming, collaborating, and planning together what this day uh, could look like for us. And so if you are here, I'd like you to stand and be recognized for our leadership advisory. Miles Erdley, Doris Johnson, Stephanie Nip, John Sander, Eric Hong, Ann Valenzuelo, Randy Heath, Chris Loftus, Luann Decker, Mariah Martin, Sandra Mart Murray, and Will Williams. Round of applause, please, for these people. Thank you. And I would also, as you are um, moving in and out through the day, if you see Tracy Phillips at our front desk, she's still taking sign-ins right now, but she has done an amazing job putting this uh, retreat together for us. Please give her a thank you as well. We would not be able to have this event if it weren't for the cooperation and willingness to host uh, at Kentwood High School. I'd like to give a special thanks to John Nisley, principal here, and Jay Hurst, assistant principal. Awesome. Uh, we were on task still at 7, 8 o'clock last night. Somebody, we needed microphones in the commons, and Jay texted and said, I can do that. So we, this has been a real team effort of uh, bringing us all together today. Another announcement before um, I kick us off here, KPA will be meeting in this auditorium at the end of the day, similar to how we did last year. So just um, put that in your mind if you are KPA. And for your convenience, today's presentations either are recorded and all PowerPoints and handouts will be made available to you on the KSD leadership team site, SharePoint site. So either recorded or all materials will be loaded on there for you, for you to be able to access. Just want to make sure you've all signed in and uh, this day is worthy of clock hours, so we'll be granting those as well. And at this time, I would like to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Calvin Watts, who will introduce board members and new administrators and present his opening State of the District. Dr. Watts. Thank you, Dr. Onsing, and Thank you to our leaders who are here this morning. Can you hear me? Do you, do you want to hear me? <laughs> so good morning. Good morning. morning. That's pretty good. I've seen some of you with your coffee. You can try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So we are here to learn. Uh, it was just literally more than a, a year and a half, two years ago, where we talked about the idea of this retreat. And we think about a retreat, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna change in the interest of projecting where we need to be uh, versus where we are. This is our leadership team retreat. When you think of the word retreat, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Audience participation. Going backwards. Going backwards. Run away. Run away. Hi. Hi. Rest. Rest. What else? Retreat again. Reflect. So if you think about the word retreat, it, yes, it does mean take a step back. It does mean to fall back for the purpose of reflecting, for the purpose of thinking about what we've done, where we are, and more importantly, where we need to be. The purpose of, re of a retreat is also to re-energize, to rejuvenate. 
to regain that sense of purpose that may have been lost at some point due to what we all refer to as reality. Life, hell, I'm busy right now. So when we retreat, we reflect for the purpose of advancing. And this becomes our signature learning event. I've said from day one, the experts are in the room. We have everything we need to solve every problem we have and to avoid those problems in the future. And why not create an environment that is more akin to a conference than just a retreat? And so today, I'm excited because we are beginning that example of a practicing quality organization where the experts in the field were relying on you and your wisdom, bless you, your experiences to share with others because each one can and should teach one and we can and should learn from one another as a practicing quality organization. So again, I want to welcome you. Before we begin today's learning, I would be remiss if I did not introduce and certainly say thank you again and welcome to members of our school board. Uh, and I do see two, thank you. And I will make sure that those of you who uh, are here, you know and will thank along with me. First of all, I'd like to recognize our president of our school board, Maya Vengadasalam. Would you please stand and give a wave and let's give her a round of applause and a welcome to her. And again, on behalf of our, our school board, I, I would also like to introduce school board director, Karen DeBruler. Would you also stand to be recognized this time? Well, our other directors, uh, Debbie Strauss and Audra Burchard, could not be here today, we certainly want to send them our uh, regards. And as we do know, uh, our former, now uh, recently, uh, school board director, Russ Hanskin, was not here for obvious reasons. We do thank him again for his service. Now, for our leaders who are here, for our leaders who are leading at our school level, I want to introduce our administrative interns and our new administrators who are leading at the highest level and most important facilities in Kent School District. When I call your name, would you please stand? We're not going to do the Mr. or Mrs. America where you walk across the stage. We have, we have retired that, that uh, tradition. However, it is important for you to be recognized and for others to see who you are. So if you'd stand and be recognized and Let's save our applause for all until the very end. First, Ms. Anna Alvarez. Anna is completing her program through Central Washington University and her supervising principal is Dr. Brian Patrick at East Hill Elementary. Next, Mr. James Blanton. Mr. Blanton is completing his program through University of Washington Danforth and his supervising principal is Mike Albrecht at Kent Ridge High School. Ms. Edith Brimon. Edith's completing her program through Seattle Pacific University and her supervising principal, Dr. Rosa Cabrera at Neely O'Brien Elementary. Ms. Danielle Dijon. Danielle is completing her program through Western Governors University and her internship will be completed at Carriage Crest with Principal Robert Gallagher and at Cedar Heights Middle School with supervising principal, certainly to be named. And Heidi Maurer, you will be serving as her, her supervising principal for this time. Ms. Tracy Doerr, she is completing her program through Heritage University and her supervising principal is Brian Rosan at Cedar Valley. Ms. Jershon, excuse me, Mr. Jershon Foyston. Mr. Foyston, thank you. He's completing his principal and program administrator certification through City University. Supervising his internship is Principal Shannon Nash and Director of Early Learning, Paige Meyer. Cynthia, Ms. Cynthia Huber, thank you. 
Cynthia is completing her principal and program administrator certification through University of Washington Danforth, supervising her internship as principal Kathy Lewandowski at Lake Young's and ex executive director of curriculum and instruction and Valenzuela. Thank you. Ms. Misty LaKay Peterson. Thank you, there we are. She is completing her principal and program administrator certification through, also through University of Washington Danforth, supervising her internship as principal Sherilyn Euland at Northwood Middle School and executive director of student family support services, Randy He. Thank you. It's Christy Nelson. Christy is completing her program through Seattle Pacific University and her supervising principal is Scott Abernathy at Glen Ridge Elementary. Mr. Saul Peterson. Saul, good morning. He is completing his program through Western Governors University and his internship will be completed with Shannon Nash, Principal Nash at Meeker Middle School and Principal Tricia Hoyle at Fairwood Elementary. Ms. Melanie Reddy, she's completing her program through also through University of Washington Danforth and her supervising principal is Mr. Tim Helgelson at Sawyer Woods Elementary. Ms. Carly Wyatt, good morning Carly. Good morning. Thank you. She is completing her principal and program administrator certification through University of Washington Tacoma, supervising her internship as principal Harjit Sandra Fuller at Scenic Hill Elementary and Director of Early Learning, Paige Meyer. And Ms. Amelia Yona, who unfortunately could not be here, we certainly want to uh, send her our regard. She is, however, completing her program and, and should be noted through University, excuse me, Seattle University and uh, will be completing her internship at Kent Lake High School. Let's take a moment to extend our uh, appreciation and thanks for these new leaders welcoming us, welcoming us to Kent School District. Thank you so much. Congratulations for this next step in your leadership development. We're counting on you and we're looking forward to great things as a result of your, your leadership. Now as we think about leadership, so we've just introduced several members of our team. Our team, Team KSD. There's a reason why we're known as Team KSD. Team, how many of you have ever served on a team before? Or are currently serving on a team now? Everyone in this room should be raising their hand, at least one team. Whether it's a, an instructional team, or a work team, or an athletic team, the idea of team means that we are working together to achieve a common goal. There's consistency of purpose and there's consistency of practice. Does it mean that we're all going to think the same way at the same time? No. Does it mean that we're always going to agree? No. And in context, does it mean that everyone's role is going to be the same or is going to be as important as another at that very moment? Based on context, sometimes roles may differ in, in importance. However, what is also important is that we all understand our roles. We all understand what we need to do, when we need to do it, and more importantly, why we need to do it, and do it well. You've heard me say that <laughs> I pay attention to my surroundings and I know that leadership is, it's not easy. And what we signed up for, so everyone just, you can, technically you can still run for the door, but someone will be here to block you. 
If you didn't know, leadership is dangerous. It is, it is difficult, it is challenging, and we get to do this every day. If, if it were easy, everyone would be doing it. Everyone would want to. Everyone would be able to do it well. So I charge and challenge, particularly those who are, who are new, who are joining us now, to understand today the importance of leadership. It can be the difference between quality of life. It can be as difficult and as challenging as some days might seem. But when you look at our why, look at these faces on this title board. This is our why. 27,700 reasons why we come to our places of work every day. But I mentioned context. Some days and some individuals are more important Every day is urgent and important for these individuals here. So as we kick off, we think about our theme, breaking ground. You know, I stood here, and while it was squeaking, I still have a sense of confidence that it's not going to fall. You think about building a home or redesigning a home, and two years ago when I arrived and I asked several research questions to many of you, what do you love about Kent School District? What are your pain points, frustrations? What are you most proud of? What do we need to do first? Many of you remember those conversations, I'm sure. And I took copious notes, and that became the underpinning for our blueprint, our strategic planning process. Two things resonated, two concepts, far and away, the most frequently mentioned, what are we most proud of? Our rich diversity. In fact, we are one of the most diverse school districts, not just in the state of Washington. According to Niche Predictive Analytics website, we are the most diverse school district in the state of Washington, and we are the 11th most diverse school district in this country. We will be the Petri dish. The Petri dish for, how do you do this? How do you ensure that 138 languages and socioeconomic levels that are as wide and vast as the oceans and the assets to address those needs may not be present in the cities in which we serve? How do we do this? Some might say, I'm not sure yet. Some might say the jury is still out in our progress because we have random acts of excellence. Our goal, and you recall, Legacy goal, leaving the room better than when you found it. Every one of us has that charge. Not just your room, not just your school, but this place, Kent School District. And beginning with the end in mind, how are we going to leave this place better than we found it? It starts with ensuring that there are no predictors. No predictors with regard to race, ethnicity, the amount of money in a family's bank account, the zip code that predicts how a student will perform. Now that's simple to say, not easy to do. Today we're going to break ground to learn because learning means we have to disrupt. You don't learn unless you change the way you currently think. In some ways we have to unlearn. Think about the concept of learning. Some, some things we have to stop doing. And the third way to think about it is we have to relearn. Perhaps there's old knowledge of information that we have to use in a very different way. Today is a day, breaking ground. So we're getting to coherence. We're getting to that place where systems, it feels right. There's not a tuggle and tug in between. There's not a question mark or a raised eyebrow when a decision is made or an action is taken. It makes sense when we're coherent. But just because, as this quote says, for those who can or can't, Read it, I'll read it aloud. Those, when you think just because we aren't making progress as fast as we would like, doesn't mean that we're not making progress. Keep going. Persist through problem solving. And we have problems. It's part of life, we do have problems. I'll be the first to admit. And if we simply focus on those problems, 
and less so on the solutions or the process that's going to get us out of the problems and focus on how we avoid those problems in the future, then this will be our best. I had a conversation with the new Parks and Rec director of the city of Kent, and she asked in our discussion, do you feel like, we're, do you feel like you're moving forward? She's been on the job for six months, and uh, I said, you know, that's, a, that's an amazingly timely question. And I have to say yes, and I feel like, as a leader, and as part of our, our work, that we are taking two steps forward and it feels like at the most inconvenient time, we take one step back. Two steps forward and one step back. Now, one could say, wow, that's, that's tough. If you think about doing the math, that's still what? It's still progress. That's not the sustainable progress that we are aiming for. We cannot get through until we break through this problem or problems that we haven't solved yet. So what does that mean? That means we need to communicate more effectively. Seven times, seven ways. We've mastered the art. One-way communication. Even today, I just learned recently that human beings now have the attention span that's slightly ahead of goldfish. And that takes us to about every 12 seconds or so we check out. That's adult learning theory. Now, when I learned it first, it was 20 seconds. But about that time, we check out. So think about what we're missing at any time. If I deliver a message, you deliver a message one time, someone is not hearing it. But we assume through communication, everyone hears it. So this message regarding Team KSD and coherence was first delivered at a leadership team meeting during 1617. It was then delivered in April at Executive Cabinet. It was then delivered at a May 22nd Executive Cabinet. It was then delivered June 8th at a leadership team at Central Admin staff meeting. It was also delivered June 28th, or excuse me, 26th, on a Saturday at our Spring Board Superintendent Governance Retreat. It was delivered August 3rd at our Cabinet Retreat, and today. And do you think this will be the last time that we continue this conversation, this dialogue. No, it shouldn't be. Seven times, seven ways. And when you think about this way, you have children, or you have pets, and you say something, and you say it again, and, and for some reason, just not getting through. And you say to yourself, I am so tired of having to say this. You probably need to say it at least 20 more times. When you feel like you're getting sick of hearing it, it still needs to be repeated. Use that as a test. This is our role. How do we implement coherence? Central administration, remember, supporting, serving schools. That's why central office exists. A coherent organization has to be able to support and sustain this improvement over time. Those words that are underlined are underlined for a reason. Trust jumps out at me today. Vision jumps out at me, responsibility, their capacity. These students, actual photos of our graduates. A summative evaluation of our work. 1,659 students. I was able and had the honor to shake hands and work with, with our principals to ensure that eight for eight, no one has fallen down the, the steps, and that's, that's, that's real, that's serious. And, and I say that because safety has to be our, our primary component. Safety in our learning environments, physically, emotionally, socially. How will they continue to be successful once they leave Kent School District? That's our true measure of success and coherence. We have to be unified. You know, I read an article about the Pacific Northwest that we are one of the most kind cultures in this country. Kind was defined as, and I found this interesting because I'm a Pacific Northwestern while I've lived other places, kind was defined as taking that, that moment to, to 
share your beliefs, your thoughts towards a certain concept or, or system. In other words, not necessarily being nice, nice saying hello or, or just uh, shaking a hand or a greeting. It was interesting. It was kind, I mean, taking care of others, kind social justice, kind social issues. In fact, they said there were more people in the Pacific Northwest who were more inclined to lay their life on the line on a set of railroad tracks to protest the overuse or abuse of fossil fuels than there were people who would actually say hello while walking down the street. Fascinating. Now, how can we help change that? Because there are students, there are staff members, there are adults among us who, who need that. And we do, as human beings, we need that unity. We need to be able to stick together, particularly in good times, because good times happen more often. When bad times happen, and that was another part of it. Pacific Northwest said that people stick together really well in bad times. And I would argue that those crises happen fewer, less often than the good times. So how do we keep that customer service orientation, that mutual respect, that nice and kind? It's logically consistent. It makes sense what we're doing. A coherent organization, and again, those who've heard me say this is my favorite word, it's lucid. It's reasonable. Public Education Leadership Project, Harvard University. You know the PELP framework. We've adopted, excuse me, adapted this model for our blueprint. In this circle, it's our core business. It's, it's our relationship between our teachers, our students, and those who support teachers, and the content. It's our strategies that we use to ensure that students know and staff know what our learners should be able to do as a result so they can be reasonably successful at the next grade level. But then there's the fact that none of us live or operate outside of a vacuum. We, we don't. We live within the context of our community. We had a conversation today. You think about it, just for less than 30 seconds. Talk to your neighbor about what's going on in the world. And I define the world as any place around you that might impact our work at a local school. 20 seconds, we'll come back. <laughs> Conversations to a natural ending point. Audience participation, shout it out. What's going on in the environment that we call the world that may impact our work at the local schools? What say you? The divisive nature of cultural politics. The divisive nature of cultural politics. I, I won't even ask you to expound, but we'll start there. So you've set a high bar. Thank you, Robert. What else? Uncertainty. Uncertainty. What else? The economic divide. Economic divide. What else? complete lack of logical consistency that may distract people. What else? Immigration policy. Immigration. 
immigration policy. This is outside of our work. Now we can try and shield ourselves, and we can do that by focusing on our work. At the same time, we also know that we need to make sure that we are understanding the components of politics. Remember, politics is not necessarily a bad thing. It is about power relationships. However, we see it as ineffective and dysfunctional when that power is not shared or shifted appropriately, when it's hoarded or not divided equally or equitably. We see this in local, state, national, the world. This has to be our focus. And that's why this work is now more important than it's ever been. These are the challenges, however. Implementation. 43 school facilities, 42 schools with all varying characteristics. What does redesigning the organization look like? It doesn't, and I've shared this before, it doesn't mean simply painting the outside of, of a building. It may mean changing the way we do our business, our core business. Developing. Ladies and gentlemen, I was so pleased to, to, to be able to mention several names today as we, as we again turn the vision into reality of leadership development. We are going to have to be more responsible for growing our own leaders. That is where sustainment occurs for an organization. Remember, professionalism, the needs of the organization, Kent School District, will always supersede an individual's. And if we believe that, and we care about our organization, and we're celebrating 150 years of existence in about a year and a half, 150 years from now, none of us will be here. I can 99.9% .9 guarantee that. Best we know knowledge of science. However, what we do today, what we are discussing today, what we're going to learn today, may in fact impact the lives of those who will be here 150 years from now. That's why this is so important and why this work is so much more important than just me, you, individuals. Developing capacity, allocating resources. Now, more than ever before, this has to be our focus. And by resources, Yes, I do mean financial resources. And I could stop there, and we'd all understand. And I don't mind having these conversations. Doesn't mean I like to have these conversations. I don't mind having them, because at some point, we as an organization must reach a point of critical mass, that sense of urgency that says, what's our, what is our tipping point that's going to impact change? Remember, we can't improve unless and until we do what? Change. change. We cannot improve unless and until we change. And data. Data doesn't tell us everything, but it does give us information if we use it in the way that we're supposed to working with our board, and we will have change. We know that. Our goal is to work together in concert and thinking about all the teams that we work on. That's one of the teams that, that I'm a part of. How do we ensure that defining and redefining our roles and responsibilities, relationships to the work, reestablishing and relearning and unlearning what practices may have been with regard to management oversight for staff and governance for our school board and how that work takes place on a daily basis, that balance. Core values, so tomorrow, the world said equity, addressing the needs of each individual, excellence, the standard to which we all aspire, and community, our work, internal, external. If the world said these were no longer important, would we still believe these were our core values? Now that's for you to answer individually, but our goal is to make sure that we give you all of the compelling reasons why 
these should remain. And if not, a coherent organization also has a system and the performance culture to enlist those individuals who may disagree and to do so agreeably. Perhaps we do need to adjust and we will have that opportunity every five years in our strategic planning process. Our vision, where do we see ourselves in five years, 10 years? How do we see our work? We have community members who, who believe strongly that we are pitting fine arts, dramatic arts, against steam, STEM, manufacturing, and nothing could be further from the truth. I do understand why that could be viewed by some of our community members. The reality is we have to do both, and then some. We live in the fourth most densely populated manufacturing region in the country. Two, and this is not purposeful in terms of, of their wealth, but the reality is two of the wealthiest individuals on this planet are from this state, this region. Because of Amazon, because of Microsoft, our fulfillment center, the way we do business is going to have to change, and it has changed because of those individuals. How are we preparing our students and the latest research says that we shouldn't be preparing our students to be effective in something. How does our work need to change if our charge now is to prepare our students to be successful in anything? The measure of success in the 22nd century will be graduates who are able to create jobs for others, not get a job not have a career. Those who will be able to create jobs for others. How are we aligned to do that today? Rhetorical question, one that we must think broadly and deeply about. If we are not organized and structured to do just that, then what must be our next steps? Our mission, simple, not easy. We've defined what success means. We've defined what preparedness means as we focus on readiness. We know what our students mean. But this is the word that I'm paying more attention to now than I ever had. Their futures. Kindergarten registration. Entering 2017, 2018, the class of 2030. I think we pretty much have an idea of what our reality is going to be in the next 13 years. At least, I think I do. Technology is going to change exponentially, but not so much for our five-year-olds or our entering kindergarten students. What will their world look like? What will they have access to in 13 years? And how will we, more importantly, be prepared to ensure that they're ready for 2030? So we have goals our four goals. Student success, remember, it's not just academic, it's social, it's applied learning. Two-way meaningful communication, not just let me talk to you, I hope you got it. It's dialogue, it's meaningful, it's cross languages, it's what's not being said. It's more important, it's listening. Organizational effectiveness, and we can't do it without our people. So these are our priorities. Remember, KSD 2.0, as we talk about priorities. I've tweeted this, I've said this, I've talked to my wife about it, talked to my son, talked to our dog. In truth, and think about everything that we had on our plate. And in public education, we are our own worst enemies. We, sometimes we have things put on, truthfully, legislative, unfunded or underfunded mandates. That's a part of the job. How do we navigate that? How do we push back when it needs to be in the right way, in the right manner? But we do have quite a few things on our plate. And I, I would argue that it's no longer a plate, it's a buffet table. But in public education, what do we not do as well? We put things on, and rarely do we take time to, to ask what question. What do we need to 
take off if, if that's possible. And even if it's not possible, even if we're asking the question, it's going to make us think differently. What do we need to stop doing? So, in this time, and it's not new for public education, when we've been asked to do more, when we've been expected to do more, with less for the foreseeable future, and I'm going to tell you, at least for me, maybe not for you, but I have a sneaky suspicion you might feel the same way I do, and that we have this shared understanding that it feels like we have been asked to do everything with nothing forever. And we've got to strike a balance, because that's not possible, nor should it be, which means we must prioritize with the resources that we have. This is the definition. I'd like for us to operationalize for priorities. So under these conditions, what is it that we identify as a particular need that's more important and deserves serious attention from our stakeholders? Now that's, that's a broad question and that's a tough question, but if we can get down to the, to the, the core, we truly ask ourselves. Steve Jobs, with that very same that's the very same function, you say in our, in our, our reading from our esteemed colleague and educational practitioner, thought leader, Dr. Schmoker, in his article. Steve Jobs said, yeah, I, I, let's take the, the best 100 ideas that you have, and then, then let's call that down to the 10. And then I'm going to take the three best, and that's what we're going to focus on. That's prioritizing. And when we have priorities, remember, we began, for those who've been, we had our strategic plan, we had seven goals. Part of that plan, the board agreed and, and supported and said, how can we decrease that number to one that's more manageable or measurable? We paid homage to the past and turned seven goals into four. And consolidating those themes our priorities are matching those themes. If you notice, there are four priorities. Transforming, teaching, and learning. Transformation, what does transforming mean? When you hear that word, first thing that comes to your mind. Change. I know you, I know you're louder than that. What else? Take something we already do and rearrange it in a new way. Take something we already do and rearrange it in a different way, a new way. Excellent. What else? Transformation. Make it, better. Make it better. I heard from a colleague, transformations happen every day. Sometimes it can be viewed as scary. But think about a caterpillar, goes into a cocoon, becomes a butterfly. That's a transformation. There are parts of a caterpillar that remain, however, it is transformed and able to do something different. Our teaching and our learning must be different and consistent and pervasive so that no matter where our students are enrolled, that they have the access to success, that they have the opportunity to go back several slides to be globally competitive learners, as our vision indicates. Communication. That's all of us. It's not one person's or one department's responsibility. While it may say so, we are our own best public relation officials. Or sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. I can't tell you how many opportunities I have to spread the word, the truth, and the light in aisle seven of Safeway. Sometimes I hear, it's that, seven, seven, oh, it's that, seven, seven, seven. I turn around. Tell them once, here to serve, how are you? Tell me your name. Yes, I shop, I'm not ashamed of what's in my grocery cart. I, I'm a human being, we have to eat in the Watts household, right? we do. And we talk, we've talked about real estate, we've talked about programs, we've talked about initiatives, we've talked about concerns. And then I share, these are the three things that I'm so proud of, and I want you to know that, and what you just shared with me is something that I'm gonna add to the list of what we need to work on. That's a, that's a conversation. That is 
what all of you, each one of you, are principles. If I could change your titles, remember I've changed, I've already changed our bus drivers and our office managers to directors of first impressions. As I said, my wife and I, 27,000 children, one who rides the bus every day, and he has been vocal about how much his bus driver appreciates the fact that weekend comes, have a great weekend. Monday morning, how was your weekend? Principles. If I could change your title, I would change it to mayor. Mayor of your community. You, no matter how you choose to frame it, you are the mayors. You should be the face, the voice of your community. And we're going to, to be more proactive and supportive so that our communication is broadened and strengthened because of your role. And, and you do it well. We want to make sure we're doing it coherently and consistently. Leadership development, I've shared that. We are now getting closer to the refinement of an academy of a, not just a tap on the shoulder to say, you know what? Have you ever thought about leadership? Have you ever thought about leadership beyond the classroom because you're a leader? Leading students, however, is very different than leading adults. Beyond that, creating a curriculum, creating a case study, creating an opportunity for leaders to be developed so that we can subsist and sustain our organization. Because we're all not going to be here forever. So these are the initiatives I'm going to share with you the alignment between priority. Remember, the conditions that exist, well, these are then the programs, the processes, the actions that are related to a priority that when they're implemented, guess what? They should be measured, they should be monitored for a sense of wellness. How are we doing? Have we, have we done what we said we would do? Have we done it well or not so well and why not? Now what you're going to see are not initiatives that we're going to start tomorrow. Because remember, prioritization means we have to choose and choose wisely. And there are voices in this room who I'm going to rely on even more so than, than I have in the, in the past from just general conversations, as you'll see in a future slide. We need to share this wealth of knowledge our initiatives for transforming teaching and learning begins with this thought. Think about our students, what I share with you about our kindergarten class of 2030. Mr. Tagore, are we limiting our children based on what we believe? Because their future is before us. A curriculum that is aligned vertically and horizontally. Simply put, do our students and our staff who are teaching them directly know what little Calvin should be able to do in order to be reasonably successful at the next grade level? Is there an agreement? If not, and from my conversations with many of you, then we do not have this yet. Defining rigor is a part of that conversation. Redefining readiness for post-secondary, redefining what that means for our students. Technology, remember I shared with you rich diversity, that was one of the two most important, most frequently mentioned, what are you most proud of, and number two is technology. And when I ask the question, how are we, how will we, how should we be using and utilizing our technology to inform, to enhance, to advance teaching and learning? Options for curriculum. I've also joked that into our, our team and curriculum and instruction, I think you could, can relate to this. In my next professional life, I want to be a publishing company executive because I have the intellectual property rights to words. I bind them, I sell them. Next year, I change one word and I can charge even more. Now, I say that in jest, the reality is we have resources now that are less expensive and just as, if not more meaningful for our students and the way in which they learn. 
we need to continue considering those as a viable option. So curriculum, that's the C. The next is A, assessment. How do we know what students have learned? If that's the case, we must have a balanced assessment program. It has to be formative. We had several opportunities. For example, if I asked you, give me a thumbs up if you are getting a sense of what our next steps are for the district, thumbs up if you are not quite sure, give me a sideways thumb, and, and if you don't know or don't agree, thumbs down. If you gave that to me, that's a, an example of a formative assessment. It's assessment for learning. Now I can adjust based on what I hear. I can adjust accordingly, or I can stop if everyone has mastered the concept. Absent of that, we might be doing more when we need to do less. Communication. George Bernard Shaw said it best in the example of one-way communication. What's the illusion? That communication is actually taking place. We cannot assume well, I told you, well, I sent you an email. Well, remember when we talked about guilty, and we all are. How do we manage this effectively with all the communication opportunities that we have? And I say opportunities because they are. So what are our opportunities? Not all in one day, but these initiatives are examples of how we can improve our communication, our meeting structure. And I thank, again, those who were on the planning committee. I was remiss as well. There were two individuals, and I know I do not uh, give this information to, to Pam, and my apologies, that uh, Dr. Jewel Harmon and Carmen Ram, our Chief Accountability and Chief Information Officer, respectively, were also serving on the planning committee for this retreat slash conference. For those who are giving their time as thought leaders and thought providers, we could not be more grateful. Remember, we are relying on you as experts. But to have one voice, one message, to have you in the room so that we're hearing your questions, we're responding to them, you're getting an opportunity to collaborate vertically, horizontally, across levels, that is our next step. One voice, one message. Consolidating our time and using it more effectively so that you're not out of your buildings onesie, twosie at six or seven times per, per month. That's the why. Meetings, you can ask anyone. You'll get 33%, 33%, 33%. You want meetings, do you not want meetings? Maybe. Never fails. But meetings are important. What we have to make sure is that they're effective. Those meetings are examples, professional learning communities, cross-functional action teams, a data review committee so that we know what we are working with. I cannot, I will not ever stress anything more importantly than knowing our work and the data that will help drive our next conversation to help impact our next move, operational, instructional, or community-wise. And we've shared examples of what our own communication needs to look like. How many of you use social media? Whether professionally or personally. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Skype. So what I've learned is, and I'm gonna put myself in the category of those adults who are considered uh, alumni, alumni of a school district, right? So those who have graduated now are in uh, mature adults. Studies have shown, by and large, mature adults use Facebook as their primary source of communication along social media platforms. Parents, Families is the same. Those who have graduated five to 10 years from post-secondary use Instagram as their primary source of communication. Our current students, those who are sitting in our seats and will be sitting in these seats 
in a few short weeks, their primary social platform, social media platform is Snapchat. So let's think about that. We, as an organization, do not permit Snapchat. We can look at it two ways, and I understand. It can be, any tool can be misused and abused. Or we can look at it as, what opportunities for communication to our most important customers are we missing? Because I can tell you right now, and Apple has already, they've already projected and said their next several devices in the next iteration, we're gonna call them iPhones, but they won't be phones anymore. Because every student, by and large, has a device. But when's the last time you've actually seen a teenager talking on a telephone? You know why? You haven't, because they don't. We have to keep up. So part of our social media etiquettes, part of our website refresh, part of our committees, our leadership councils, some of you have already responded to a request uh, for counsel and leadership support that will continue to change and evolve, and each one of you in here will have a role and a part to play in advising and recommending for our district success. A district initiative that's piloting now so that we can monitor and measure how and to what extent we are satisfying customers through communication is Let's Talk, and that is currently underway. Organizational effectiveness is our third goal. Resource management is our initiative. Look what three, these three individuals said, for those who may not be able to read. Maya Angelou, famed artist in terms of the spoken word and the written word. She writes that our, our greatest resource is one that is within us, our human heart. We are more alike than we are unalike, she says. Herbert Hoover said our children are our most valuable resource. Could not agree more. In fact, none of us would be here, let me remind you, if it weren't for our children. Third, Steve Jobs. And this hit me, actually, in the most recent retreat, because I, I said in jest, if you have read or seen or, or know, Steve Jobs, he did know, he, he certainly was a, a successful businessman who did not have success all throughout. He learned from those failings. But here's what he said, my favorite things in life. Don't call it a thing in terms of financial resources. It's really clear, he said, and I think about this. What's the most valuable resource for Steve Jobs, he said, is time, and it hit me, because at that moment, I wasn't thinking that Steve Jobs' body is no longer with us. Can you imagine now the profundity of that last sentence? Would you care to guess, if he were with us right now and could hear us, would he rather have time back, or would he rather have all of his money? And you can answer that on your own, but I want us to think about that. What are we doing with our time? What are we doing with our time? Financial stewardship. We'll be talking about this uh, early and often. Reform policy, data acquisition analysis, avoiding the drip, DRIP, that means data rich, information poor. We have all the data. Our goal is to make sure we have the information that's important from that data. And operational efficiency, to make sure that our processes are in line and that we're getting the results that we expect based on the systems we have. Sometimes we need an objective observer. We all have blind spots. Organizations have blind spots, and they're called blind spots for a reason, because you can't see them. Sometimes we need someone else to say, you know what? I see what you're doing here may need to change. I see what you're not doing here. You might need to start doing this and leadership development. So you think about the synonymous quote, what does leadership mean to you at its base, some might say, and one might have said, leadership is influencing others to do what they otherwise would not do, seemingly because they wanted to. That's the ownership, not the buy-in. Remember, buy-in means you're trying to sell someone something. But we want to make sure that they believe 
that they're owning this work. And I want to thank Dr. Decker for taking the, the reins and helping to turn that vision as a cornerstone of this organization. Leadership development has to be for students, for families and communities, for our teachers, for our assistant principals and principals, and for our district administrators. In a continuum, we must have a pipeline development. So Jim Collins also said this. Confront not just the facts. Confront the brutal facts. You know, the time when your wife says, you know better. That time when she says, remember that not to do list? It's getting longer. And I learned a long time ago those two words, yes, dear, got it. In all seriousness, we all have to face brutal facts. And I'm talking about the facts that, that we're not proud of at the same time. More importantly, in that parenthetical note, so when my wife says, and Robbie says, you know what? You got to do this, and I need you to stop, I need, I need your help. Hey, I get it. If I wasn't, thank you for communicating with me. I needed to hear that. And don't you ever lose faith that I will continue doing this because I have to get better. I need you to help me just as I help you get better so that we can be better. Never lose faith. However, do not be afraid to confront the brutal facts. And not just in the parking lot, not at home in your heart of hearts, during the day, in the work. So here's what we need to face. You can read, for those who can't, if it's not large enough in the back. This is what we've done to face the real facts of our fiscal challenge. We administered strict hiring and spending controls. And I know I used the word freeze, and I stopped using that. Remember, we, the moment we say we don't need to do something, I'm going to tell you that I need to stop doing it. I'm going to tell you why. So I, I stopped using and I helped our team, and I'm helping our broader team to, to remove that term from your vocabulary when we're talking about the work regarding our spending and our hiring. Why is that? Because remember when you were young, or maybe when you were a little older, you played the freeze game or freeze tag. Everybody freeze. What do you do, right? And you always have that pose. Well, you stop moving. Money doesn't stop flowing. Hiring doesn't just stop. So freeze does give the wrong impression. What we want to be able to do is to make sure that we are controlling, we put strict measures on those controls so that the hiring that we do, the spending that we do, it's part of our coherent system. It's understandable, it's reasonable. Our material supplies and operating cost reductions to the tune of 20%. You were highly instrumental in helping us as an organization reduce our MSOP expenditures. And I'm going to tell you that's a thank you. And there's more to be done. 1617, our board thankfully approved the process that we have for the interfund loan from our capital funds, capital projects fund to the tune of 10 million. That was then repaid with interest. The board also approved a second interfund loan for 15 million to be repaid in April of 2018, and that will be repaid with the appropriate subsequent interest. We appreciate certainly that opportunity. And hear me when I say, while I appreciate it, I never want us to be in a position where we have to borrow from Peter to pay Paul to coin my own 12 years of Catholic education and born and raised a Baptist. 
Why did we do that? We did that because I never want to be in a situation where the people who are working hard and smart every day for our families, for your families, that you at the very least can have your paychecks arrive on time, that your benefits will be readily available should you need them. If I'm not making myself clear about the sense of urgency that we need to change our course of action, let me be even more clear. 2017-18, continuation of strict hiring and spending controls. We're still there, and we will do even better in terms of communicating the why, the how, and the what. MSOP productions will continue and we will also have processes as we have. Remember, if you need something, just like we've said in public, if you see something, say something. If you need something, say something. We're not saying that we want you to do without completely. We just have to do some things differently and it's going to be uncomfortable, not impossible. Smaller and tighter class size allocations, we did cut 34 and almost a quarter of an FTE and we've suspended hiring from non-classroom positions. So far this, this year, we've continued to not fill many of our district level vacancies. Purpose is to cut 10 to 12 FTE. All school and district leadership positions, we are hiring mission critical positions and we are only planning to fill them as needed with internal candidates. Third, we suspended hiring of certificated positions in August. 1718, reassignment of current employees to classroom positions is an option that's on the table. We are seeking now to capture 10 to 12 FTE. Challenges. Right now, information that we believed we had was not the information that we actually had. What I will tell you is that we have to do a better job, and I'll say this as an understatement, we must do a better job of projecting, knowing where our resources, how our resources are being allocated, and helping each other to allocate those resources and spend those resources efficiently and effectively. At this point today, we are running at a deficit and projected to have an end of year deficit balance of close to $7 million. Unacceptable. A year ago, two years ago, did not, six months ago, did not expect uh, and we will talk more about that towards the end of the day. But remember when I said that, that this day is about learning. And the irony of learning is that we can't learn unless we're disrupted. Once you learn something, our neurons, synapses, they're forever changed. You can't go back. And I don't know of any other way to, to communicate with you about a sense of urgency than, than this. I will tell you that, that we will be working with our board. We will be developing a plan. It is a plan that I have fully accepted. I have vetted with team members. I'll be working with individuals from OSPI. We are working on closing out our contract negotiations at the same time we're closer than we've ever been. The reality is, and I, I use this term affectionately, but we really were working with very few resources and now we might as well say that we are working with no resources in terms of financial, so what other resources can we, we use? So here's my pledge to you, to us, because responsibility means our ability to respond to a situation. For those of you who remember the story about uh, my mom, the leadership lessons I learned from my parents. Leadership isn't measured so much in what happens. 
it is measured in large degree in how we respond. So let me just tell you that these conditions, they did not happen overnight. And as we are continuing to view, and, and I will say within the last three to seven years of patterns of data and systems, and by systems I mean people, I mean the coherence or lack thereof, I mean the systems that are the enterprise solutions that are allowing us to make and draw conclusions. We have some work to do, and we will get it done. And I accept the fact that this is a multi-year effort. First, we must bend the trend, and I accept responsibility because while these conditions didn't happen overnight, these are our current conditions today. I'm here. You're here. I accept the challenge and the charge and the responsibility. I also want us to understand that we are all accountable. Accountability means, again, we set a goal, we achieve it, something should happen. Celebrate. Course correct, pilot, bring it to scale. Accountability also means that when we set a goal and we do not achieve it, again, something should happen. Change in behavior, course correct, root cause analysis. So we're gonna help support one another. We're gonna help hold each other accountable in this learning. We're gonna communicate openly and honestly as an organization, starting yesterday, day before, starting today, starting now. And I leave you with these two words, never again. Never again do I need to, want to, should I stand before you and explain what our current conditions are. Never again. Never again should we be in this current situation. However, this is now our reality. And I look forward to working with you. I look forward to leading this effort alongside those who are charged with being a part of the team. I look forward to this learning because we are going to learn and grow and continuously improve together. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you for your engagement. And I also want to thank those who will be sharing their learning with us today. More to come. Uh, and there will be more details about some of what I've shared with you uh, later this afternoon. Thank you. Let's have a good rest of the day and learn well. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you our keynote speaker. His name is Dr. Mike Schmoker. Dr. Schmoker is a former administrator, an English teacher, and a football coach. Do you know anybody else that's an English teacher and a football coach? <laughs> he has written six books and dozens of articles for educational journals, newspapers, and for Time magazine. His most recent book is Leading with Focus, which follows his earlier bestseller, Focus, Elevating the Essentials to Radically Improve Student Learning. His previous bestseller, Results Now, which was a finalist for Book of the Year by the Association of Education Publishers, is on many of our bookshelves. Dr. Schmoker is a 2014 recipient of the Distinguished Service Award by the National Association of Secondary School Principals for his publications and presentations. He has consulted and keynoted throughout the United States, Canada, Australia, China, and Jordan. He now lives in Tempe, Arizona with his wife, Cheryl. Please give a warm Kent School District welcome to Dr. Mike Schmoker. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. It's, it's nice to see Pam. We knew each other way back when in the CELA school district. That is CELA. Is that for pronouncing? Yes. I'm working, I'm working my way through this uh, triple espresso. How many of you are like double or triple espresso drinkers? No, no additives, just the, the shots. Could you throw those hands up one more time? I'm kind of just getting a quick survey here. Yeah, because in this part of the world, that's a very common drink for you. Uh, not so much in other places, as you know, but I remember the first time I had one of these, friends of mine, when I was living in Tucson, would say, oh, if you really like coffee, 
uh, you really ought to drink just pure espresso. And it just sounded odd. And as you know, you know, there's not a lot of coffee in there, right? But it's very high octane. So, so I'm in Indianapolis, sticked. I get done with some work, and I go in and I order a double espresso like I knew what I was doing. And it comes in this little ceramic cup, you know, and I, they said, just take a little sip and then knock it back, which I did, and I waited a moment and I, and I saw God. <laughs> but I've had just thousands of these since then. Hey, you know, is there a way for us to turn those, those big floods down, way down by any chance? Because it's kind of blinding. Right? Eric and Erica are, are working on this stuff. A little, little golf clap for Eric and Erica, who've done such a great job for us today. Thank you. Thanks. So, very nice setup for me by, just give me a sick way. <laughs> oh yeah, baby. Um, nice setup by Calvin, truly. And so many, I took some notes and there's some resonance between his message and mine. And it's, a lot of it has to do with priorities, a lot of it. Um, listen, uh, look up there, give that a hard read, will you please? I'm going to guess that just about everybody in here pretty much buys into that, okay? If it's true, do you realize there's just this enormous, almost moral obligation that it places on us? It means that if we know how, you know, within reasonable bounds, if we know how to provide, but let me put it this way, a better education than the one we provide now, to a larger proportion, it's all about how many kids get it, right? Real individual kids. If we can provide a better education to a larger proportion of kids with that kind of impact at stake, the question for us is, is if we know how to do those things, aren't we obligated to do them? The answer to that has to be yes, rhetorical or no, it has to be yes. Now, if it's yes, then the question might be, and I'm gonna bring up these kinds of issues a few times, is well, what's the nature of the stuff we would do that would make the big difference? I know it says don't use this rant. Eric, you back there? I'm going to use this ramp quite a bit unless there's a law against it, okay? So, because I don't like stages too much. I think this is pretty stable, really. I think it is, really. Because <laughs> I tipped it down, right? Um, look, look at what George Orwell says here. Now, what does he mean by that? He means that we overlook stuff that's obvious, even though it might be the most important stuff we should be doing or knowing or learning or whatever it might be. Just for fun, I'm going to just go back and forth with you guys a little bit. And you're going to be talking throughout at moments with each other. Uh, oh, just take something obvious like, I think, I think this is painfully obvious, okay? R raising hands, raising hands. I cannot tell you, I've, I've been in an awful lot of classrooms, done walkthroughs. When I do walkthroughs, I see an enormous number of teachers do the following. They're explaining something, they ask questions, and then they call on certain kids who do something with one of their limbs. They, they what? They raise their hands, and the teacher makes a terrible mistake and does what? Actually calls them. Just tell each other in about 20 seconds, just tell each other in your own words what the catastrophic consequences of routine. I'm not saying you never, 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 ever call on kids with their hands raised. I mean the routine use of calling on kids with their hands raised. What catastrophic consequences does it have for the education we're trying to provide for kids? Just tell each other, because we, we all know it's incredibly obvious, is it not? Really obvious. Just tell each other. Articulate, please. I can share in about an hour, right? Um, and, and, we want, and I want you to interact some along the way. So these will be a lot of quick conversations. We already know, and I know I'm abbreviating, but when we call on kids with their hands raised, we're basically deciding. It's almost like getting up in the morning and saying, well, I'll just teach the smart kids, okay? No, we don't really, we don't actually get up in the morning and think that, do we? But in our system, and that's a word Calvin uses a lot, it's so incoherent, another word he uses quite a bit, that we allow ourselves to engage in really obvious practices that are, I mean, 
pardon the metaphor, it's we're killing kids. How about this one? How many of you would agree that most worksheets are not great resources, teaching resources? <laughs> Turn to each other and just guess what proportion of the time a kid spends in K-12 is spent filling out worksheets. Probably your school district too. Just tell each other. Just give it a wild guess. <laughs> Okay, you ready? You ready? And, and this is what I'm going to do quite a bit. If I'm going to be like a good teacher, I'm going to model good teaching. And I'm going to say three and two and one to bring you together. And if you were my students, you're not. You're not. You're not. But if you were my students, when I got to that one, where would I want all your eyes if I'm your teacher? Right. And, and just, just and this is a little parenthetical, but wouldn't you want all your teachers to have some kind of signal, consistent signal? They send the kids, which means when I get to one or I ding this ding or whatever, all lies on me. Because you can't learn without that, right? So these are the little obvious things that matter. The percentage of time a kid spends in school, just take 12 years. Let's just do it to be neat and clean. 12 years, how many of those years will be spent filling out worksheets on average in an American school? Six of those years. Six of those years at a minimum. Somewhere between six and seven. One more obvious thing to throw at you that points up uh, the bad news about schools? No, no. And by the way, I'm talking about some pretty, I realize I'm talking about some very negative, counterproductive practices here. I want you to know I personally never engage in any of them. And of course, that's why I'm here. That's why Pam brought me in. It's, well, obvious. obvious. No, listen, here's one more. Obvious and beautiful. And you'll see why in a few moments. If you walk into an English class, I mean, any class, yeah, but you walk into an English class, you expect maybe to see certain things, but what are the two things you will not see much of at all? Not much of it at all. Shockingly so, you know, common sense would dictate. What two things? It should be really obvious. If we just give two, three seconds thought to it. Give me, give me one. Pardon? Reading. Reading's one, and what's the other one? Writing. Writing. Other than that, terrific English class. <laughs> Okay? And you see, I mean, you see, you see the, the humor, but the tragedy in that? If we just change the three things I mentioned, if I walked out of here and I said, oh, that's a presentation. Thanks for bringing me in, Pam. Uh, and, and you just went out and made those your priorities, something incredible would happen in American schools. Just to give you an example, a little teaser, because I've talked more about this school in a bit. Ever heard of Brockton High School in Massachusetts? 40, 4,200 students, the lowest scoring school in the state of Massachusetts about eight or 10 years ago. The social studies chair just says, Jiminy, enough of this. Pulls the department heads together and says, we gotta do something about this. And all they did was toss together the most simple, obvious plan to address these things. What happened the very first year they put those obvious things in place? The biggest damn gain in the state of Massachusetts on the MCAS. You know, I mean, a lot of research is based on standardized test scores. They are imperfect, but they do point in a certain direction, let's face it. Biggest, big, biggest gain in the state. You think, oh, well, you know, maybe it's an anomaly. Nope. Next year, what happened? Another big gain. Third year, up, up, up. Seven years, it went from rock bottom to top 10%. What obvious things that they do? I'm only going to talk to you about those obvious things and make the case that those should be our priorities. And there will be some controversy here. And again, to cite something that uh, Calvin said, uh, you, you, you may not agree with everything I have to say here, but I hope you'll give it some fair thought, OK? Obvious things that would make a big difference. The bottom line is, whether we want to admit it or not, the impact of teaching is staggering. The evidence comes out every year or so that, oh my goodness, it isn't just a big factor. It's the factor. It can change a kid's academic trajectory. Look here. I mean, if that's even half true, and you can bet your life it is, I could line the walls with, with, with uh, slides that point in this direction. Look at this. Dylan William, you guys know Dylan William, who created a term called, you've never heard of this, you ever heard of formative assessment? <laughs> People don't know Dylan William, but he's the guy who coined the term. We'll talk about it later. What did he mean by that? Well, look what he found. You do certain obvious things, like avoid calling the kids with their hands raised. There are alternatives. You know this, don't you? You do know that. Something happens, you get about an, an you could get it up to a, on average, close to a year's growth from every kid. And guess where you get your larger gains? The lower the kid starts, the bigger the jump. 
That's pretty good news, isn't it? And then finally, you cannot believe how many people weigh in to say, about three years you completely turn a kid's life around. Three years of what dazzling, incredible teaching? No, just avoid the obviously bad stuff and adopt and focus on the good stuff and you're probably gonna wind up with something happening, something along the lines of what happened at Brockton High School, which we're gonna talk about in detail, believe me. Now, if you want everybody to teach well, not just certain teachers, uh, folks, we're in the room, the experts are in the room, as Calvin said, you're the ones that can make that happen. Now, if the stuff we're gonna talk about this morning is doable, if it has that much impact, and if teaching has, has so much impact, on, the, on, on what kids learn and therefore on their lives and well-being and literally their, their, literally how long they live, what kinds of families they'll grow up in, then we have an obligation to, to take this to heart. And I just want to throw this out and say, make a promise to yourself. If what we share this morning, and it's all original with me, again, I'm, I'm one of the leading lights in education. All this, all this research came right from, from me, from me, I did it all myself, which is to say, you know, you know, you know the late great Grant Wiggins. I'm not sharing anything original here. Absolutely nothing original. It's so obvious that almost all of you in this room probably know at least 80 percent of it. I love what Grant said. He said, "Smart people create, geniuses steal." <laughs> Let's be geniuses. Let's be geniuses and, and and ask ourselves how much. Forgive me. How much more innovating we need to do, and how much more stealing we really need to start doing. Okay. See if this doesn't doesn't uh, roll out. Here we go. The essence is, look at that, take, take that in. Really take it in. The smallest number of what? Ah, yes. High leverage. How good are we at high leverage? We're just terrible at it, as we'll see in a moment. Easy to understand actions. Those are the criteria for which, how many of you know Michael Fulham? Toss up a hand, Michael Paul, okay, well-known educator, a wise man who's been with us. I've been reading that guy since the 80s, you know that? Now, what does he say? He says, if you just, if you adhere to those three very, very simple criteria, if you don't complicate it, and boy, they, they sure as heck did not complicate this at Brockton High School, it couldn't have been a smaller number of extremely high leverage, easy to understand actions. If you want something like that to happen in your midst, here's what you get. Stunningly powerful consequences. Now, if you've ever seen Michael Fullan speak, he's not a you know he's not a preacher. He's not a you know real anime. He's just a guy who looks at the facts and says, "You want to knock it out of the ballpark? Just adhere to those three criteria." I hope to stay real close to them. The opposite of simplicity, which he elevates and celebrates, is complexity. Look at I, I can't tell you how many organizational thinkers have said, "This is what's killing us. This is what's killing us." Jim Collins, his favorite metaphor is a fox who in the stories uh, by Aesop, you know, Aesop's fables, it's all about these complex little machinations to do what? To catch the hedgehog who does one insanely simple, high leverage, easy to understand action. Smallest number of high leverage, easy to understand actions. You know what he does? He rolls up into a, a ball. That's all he does forever and ever. That's Jim Collins' metaphor for how organizations improve. What are, what are our, and I'm quoting Collins here, what are our hedgehog focus areas, our hedgehog priorities? That's what we need to find, because if we don't, if we don't make those hedgehog areas, those hedgehog focus areas, our biggest priority, they'll never get implemented. The bottom line is they won't get implemented. That's what hurts kids. Look up there. Here's Fullen again. My uh, suspicion is that the other 25% are lying. <laughs> how, many of you think, how many of you things have gotten too complicated? Okay, I'm going to try and prove to you, if you have any doubts about that, that, that we have complicated things. Now, the bottom line is you've got to reduce. You've got to, got to, got to reduce. There's no, no getting around it. Look at Peter Drucker. They late. Great Peter Drucker. How many of you remember Peter Drucker? Raise those hands. Look at all these hands. Hey, you guys, those of your hands up, you know, if any of you interested in their positions, they're going to be open soon because these are people that are about my age. They know Just to, you know, something to think about. Just, you know, 
Um, look what he says here. You've got to eliminate what does not need to be done. Oh man, is there a lot of stuff that does not need to be done in our business. Here are some of those things. Some of them might seem a little offbeat, quirky. Uh, they're not. Look here. I'll explain PD in a second here. I want to clarify. <laughs> Reduce. Okay, let's start with this. Neomania. This is how I define it. A friend of mine came up with this term. Uh, it's almost self explanatory, but I like to flesh it out like this. It's the belief that what is new and unproven is always superior to what is old and amply proven. Are you with me? That's us. That's us. I don't think. If you know of a profession that is more fad-driven than education, please send me an email. Tell me about that. I can't imagine one that's more fad-driven. So that's the issue. What about PD? When I say less PD, what I mean is less innovative PD and way fewer initiatives. We need to reduce our PD down to the min most minimalist kind of model. And just for fun, look up there. Turn to your partners. And guess whose title goes in that blank? Just guess. Now you might want to whisper. I mean, oh, waves of laughter. And in my view, I'll put it together on that with three. Two and one. In my view, this is the problem. This is the main problem. We're always chasing something new and forgetting about the old and the innovations and the fads and the stuff. They just stack up and we go, oh, we got to keep doing this and that, and it's killing us. Uh, and it, of course, bleeds into and is the substance of our PD. How many of you know or suspect? I know this is a brutal fact. This is a brutal fact if there ever was one. <coughs> ever wonder about how much impact PD has? And you think, oh, well, just one little study did that. Folks, that was a major study. It came out in, yes, 2015. It was the third study in 15 years that demonstrated PD has almost no impact. Now, you still think, oh, God, that's a strong statement. Folks, we still call on kids with their hands raised routinely. And if, if my, if, if my, I didn't, I didn't know you'd laugh at that. I mean, it really, if, if laughter is evidence of sort of, you know, I, irony, then, then good. Because I've been in a hell of a lot of classrooms over the last 20 some years, and I mean almost every, close to every teacher routinely asks a question and then calls on the smart kids who raise their hands without ever even hearing about the damage that that does. Okay? And you know there's alternatives. We'll talk about those alternatives in half a moment. But here's we're still doing worksheets, and we still do barely any reading and writing. How many of you know the evidence about writing instruction? You know what the average writing lesson and how long it takes? They've looked at this. How long is the average writing lesson? Three minutes. In other words, listen to me, you know this already. It's not a lesson at all, is it? You're just assigning it. You're describing what the kids should do. You're not teaching it. I taught, I taught at a place where most people regard as the Harvard of the Southwest, uh, that's Arizona State University. <laughs> oh, hey, hey. I, it's an IQ test. If, the longer it takes you to laugh when I say that, the, the dumber you are. But you did pretty well. You did pretty well. Out of politeness. But anyway. No, I say that just to say, I mean, very briefly. Believe me, most kids get almost no writing instruction when, by the, in, in K-12. And when they hit college, you're having to teach them the most basic basic fundamental moves that second and third graders should be taught. They should master by second and third grade, and these kids have never done them. I just want to throw one little example out, see if it doesn't resonate. Kids don't know how to integrate a quote into a sentence. Like the author tells us that, quote, blank, blank, blank. This tells us that they don't know how to do that. They've never been taught, never been taught to do those things. Not all of them, but the great overwhelming majority never been taught to do those things. What would happen, we'll see, if we did those kinds of things. Look at PD. Must be because we don't spend enough money on it. <laughs> they found there's very little relationship. Don't, you've got to be thinking at this point, why? PD would have to have an impact if we did it right. Don't you agree? It would have to. Oh, I think it would. I, I sure hope it would. Look here. This is going back to 2001. 
Why doesn't it pay off? There it is. There's your explanation. That's half the explanation. The other half is we take, we bite off too much. We take on too much. We have to focus things down to only the things that matter the most. Matter the most. So let's get to that in a minute. But uh, first, let's look here. You ever walk into a lot of classrooms and notice what I notice? And not everybody does. There's way too much group work going on. Group work is the most time-killing phenomenon I have seen in schools and districts in, in oh, 15 years. It sort of grew up, it's like cooperative learning was, was, uh, uh, was, was honored as and acknowledged as an effective way to teach. And so we just started putting kids in groups. You want to guess what percentage of the time kids, are, kids' desks are arranged so that they can engage in group work? 70% of the time, 70% of classrooms are arranged so kids can sit in fours. That is not an effective arrangement most of the time, folks. I know that sounds, you're not gonna agree with me so much. I, can, I, can, I, I know this already. But you ever hear of a book called, it's, it's an obscure book on educational research called Classroom Instruction That Works. You ever heard of that book? It's probably the best selling uh, uh, education book in history. Marzano talks about the power of cooperative learning and says two things. Same thing as other people say. The most powerful form is two kids in pair share. Number two, don't overuse group work. Good and Brophy, same thing. They said the hardest situation in which to control and ensure learning is what? Guess, putting kids in groups. I'm here to tell you stuff you don't know. When you put kids in groups of four or five, did you know some of them are learning more than others? We know this, don't we? We know this. All I'm saying is, I'm not saying stop group work. I'm not. I'm not. I'll pledge. I'm not saying. But you need to use it carefully and not overuse it. Look what Bennett says here. Now, if that doesn't resonate with you, if that doesn't resonate with you, I dare you to walk around your schools. Really take a hard look at how much time gets devoted to group work and who's really participating and what they have to produce as a result of that group work just to come to your own, your own, your very own conclusion about that. David Berliner, Doug Lamont, all these people, you don't teach like a champion by Doug Lamont. Pretty good book. I mean, I really, I'm, I'm gonna give it a, a B plus, A minus. There, if there's too much in it, that's one of, my, one of my concerns. But here's a guy that basically says, you wanna, fat, whenever I guest teach, and I do that at least once, twice a year, I love the same arrangement that he recommends as a default, and it's two kids in rows right next to each other. Why? So they can communicate frequently. Kids need to talk and articulate, articulate frequently throughout the lesson. Do you, how many of you have a gut sense that that's important? You betcha. Pairs are the most effective way to do it. So you have two desks next to each other, a space for the teacher to walk up and down. Two, de two desks, rows of desks, space. That's what he recommends. That's what I always beg my uh, cooperating, cooperating entities. That's how I say, please arrange the desks that way. That way I can maximize learning during the, during the lesson. So agree with that or not, that's what a lot of smart people are saying, I think. Now, how about this one? How about this one? Read that and then turn to your partners and guess who said it? Steve Jobs, Michael Fullan, do not ever look to technology as a driver of improvement. Folks, it's like painting a house that isn't built yet. Does that make sense? You can't paint a house that isn't built yet. Technology has a horrific record of helping schools improve. Horrific, not bad, not so-so, awful, god-awful. No evidence whatsoever. The thickest files I have are on technology and the fruitlessness of looking to it as a way to raise achievement. Again, it's like trying to build the second floor of a house that doesn't have a foundation and a first floor yet. Could be a good thing, lots of promise and potential. I believe that, but we don't want to start there. It's not a driver of improvement. If you find proof that I'm wrong, then pursue it with, every, with all your might. But until you do, let's, let's, let's not be driven by whims, fads, opportunism, and ideology, okay? Now, how about this? I wonder if this will resonate with you. Anybody ever feel a little funny about those big, elaborate teacher evaluation templates that are coming our way? 
Now, you know, this is a lot of negative stuff, a lot of brutal facts. And I, I apologize that I, I deem it absolutely essential to share these kinds of things with you. These are the largest roadblocks I see that prevent a good education from being had by large percentages of kids. Look, look, look here. First, read that, and then I'll tell you who the source is. Anybody know who the source is? Look here. Who's that? They're the ones who wrote the widget effect, which is the report that got the attention of Bill Gates, who then helped to fund. Basically, he helped to fund and spur and proliferate this mass adoption of complex teacher evaluation templates. For my money, absolutely one of the most unfortunate things to ever come upon us. And you may not love Paul Vallison, you don't have to. And he's a, you know, I, I, I there's more than one side to Paul Vallis, but I'll be forever grateful for him just coming out and saying that. <laughs> if I was a teacher and someone showed me a teacher evaluation template and I was weighing whether or not I wanted to be a teacher and someone showed me some of these templates, I think I would rather flip burgers once I saw those templates. I thought, if that's how I'm being evaluated, whoa, time out, time out. This is crazy. This is, I've written about this. Some of you, if you're real bored, put Schmoker teacher evaluation templates. Uh, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. In fact, who did, read this and then turn to your partner. Who wrote this? Who wrote that? Any guesses? Charlotte Daniels. <laughs> Whose work, let's face it, is the very template basis for all the other kinds of evaluation templates that proliferated. And she wrote in this article a kind of confession where she said, I have reduced mine by, what do you think, 20, 30 percent? Do I hear 75 percent? She says, it's still too long. Too long and complicated. Never walk into a classroom and use my instrument again. You know how many people know that? Almost nobody. Think of the harm being done. You know the worst thing you can do in a profession is use too many criteria that are hard to understand, that are mostly unproven, and they're most believed, even she admits, most of this stuff has no basis in education science. That's the worst thing you can do to a profession. Is, is, is complicate and add to all the criteria by which you and I and everybody gets evaluated. When you reduce it, something wonderful happens. You know Best Buy, that, you know, I, I sometimes toss this in. You know where Best Buy's been around a while. All companies have their ups and downs. You know where they had their biggest surge and became a real household word? When they noticed that their salespeople could not be effective for one reason only, not 10, just one. They had too many products that they had to get to know. The minute they cut their, cut their product line in half and then said, don't worry about anything else. All I want you to do, Calvin, is for that half, not, not that massive number of products, but just that half of the products, I want you to know them well enough to be able to talk intelligently to the PAMs and the others who come into the store. That's all they did, and it was the biggest boost the company ever got. One simple thing was all about reduction. Reduce, reducing things. So speaking of reduction, let's now get to, I think, the positive end of this presentation. Look up there. I pur purposely planted popular but unproven stuff in this list. I could line the walls with unproven fads in here. You guys know that. But I want you to pick out the three, which I'm, I might sound dogmatic here, okay? You don't have to you know, go with me, but I believe there are three up there which are absolutely unrivaled in their ability to change the course of education in America. Turn to your partner, see if you can find those three, and if you do, you'll all get a bonus this year, okay? Is that right, Calvin? All right. Oh, okay. All right. Pam, is that good? W, oh, wrong district. Wrong district, sorry. Which three? And 
time for answers. <laughs> Isn't that interesting, folks, that almost every time I do this, people, uh, pe people get at least two, and all, a lot of people get all three of them right. Uh, that, that's a pretty nice thing to know. Now, the interesting thing, and I don't have time to go into it, if you want to get, I mean, I'm not the only one writing about this. In fact, if you go to my articles, you'll find other people smarter than me who helped me to see this. The ones that are the most popular, built right into the uh, evaluation templates, almost, almost all those major evaluation templates, but are completely unfounded, are this one. This one is real. This is the most curious, curious occurrence I've ever seen in education. 600 books written. The person who found the whole differentiated instruction movement admits there's no evidence for it. No evidence for it, but says keep doing it. Keep putting your kids in groups by what? You group your kids by what? When, when her model, by ability. What do we know about that? It, almost, it invariably lowers expectations, probably creates two to three times as much work for teachers and promotes a worksheet orientation because you have to get all these materials assembled and given to the right kids. But to add one more layer of complication, ability grouping is not enough for her. She also says, oh, don't forget to take what else into account? Learning styles, for which there's how much evidence? Can you see any space between my fingers? There's none, no evidence whatsoever. You, you read the evidence yourself if, if you're skeptical. I don't know how we get into this, these situations. Now, there's, you know, I don't want to be fair. Um, oh, it's not up there anymore. Good, good. Yep, very good, very good. Oh, RTI, that's a really interesting one. I still think there's certain places where there's some evidence that tutoring certain kids who don't learn, they get a little extra attention, that could work. But RTI is a model. I beg you to go online and find out. Just to give you the title of an Education Week article, um, the, the, the article is RTI more popular than proven? And think of why RTI could have a, because it has been shown to have either a neutral or an, a very negative effect on first graders. Why would that be? Why would that be? I wish I had more time to go into that, but look it up. Education Week, RTI, you'll find some very interesting information there. Now look at these other three. Before I go on, I just want you to stare at those for a second, okay? That's where the pay dirt is, in, in my strongly felt opinion. What do they have in common? They're boring. They're, they're not cutting edge. They're not innovative. They get lost in all the faddishness and stuff that we tend to be doing, right? So. Just, folks, this is going to be kind of lightning quick, but you don't need that much detail. I always like to say a one-hour overview should allow anybody to go forth and begin to make really meaningful progress in these areas. Let's just start with the first one. Uh, real quick, guaranteed and viable just means you can guarantee to any parent that there is a core curriculum. That doesn't mean 100% the same. It means maybe 60 to 80% of the, the same stuff, same course, same school, same district that Pam teaches, 60 to 80 percent of it we have in common. The rest is up to us. But there's at least a core that's guaranteed to the community. Viable, raise your hand if you think there's too many state standards in our state standards documents, as well as the common cores uh, uh, documents, okay? Because there's great evidence of that. So knowing that, if Marzano's saying this is a pretty big deal, guaranteed and viable curriculum, it means you've got to reduce those standards down to the most important for it to be realistic, viable, meaning, in case I didn't make this clear, it can be taught in a nine-month school year, not a 12-month school year, right? How many of you know this stuff that's come out? And again, I, was, I, mean, I, I really am thankful to Education Week for making this clear how many people have finally gotten on board and said, my gosh, it's true. Once a kid knows how to decode, and Richard Ellington, some of you know his name, says every kid bar a small handful ought to be able to decode text by the end of what? First grade. If he's largely right, it means so much of what we do from second grade up is a terrible waste of time. Because what helps a kid do well, let's just be real cynical, do well on comprehension tests. What helps a kid, an adult, anybody, do well on reading tests? It's the amount of knowledge they bring to the text. If they know a little something about that text, right? 
And if they can decode, they'll do well on those tests. So what does that require? It's two things. A content-rich curriculum and lots of reading. That's how you acquire knowledge. What you know about, you will comprehend. It's just about that simple. So what does that mean? What does that mean for the way we teach second through 12th grade reading? We're still teaching kids homonyms. We're still giving them worksheets that say, identify the proper nouns. We're still, I mean, how important are these things relative to having kids learn a content-rich curriculum and do a lot of reading? Look at that second bullet. Turn to your partner and just explain what your gut sense is. Why would that just about have to be true? Why? And if I might, and if I might, with the time where we have three and two and one, and I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna guess that you're saying things like, well, it, unless you're working off some, something like the same basic script, there should at least be, we at least have a lot in common, the three of us as we work together. It's real hard to learn from each other how to build good lessons in units if we're all just teaching whatever we want. Makes sense? Not many people know that DeFore and Marzano basically don't even pretend to have PLCs until you have a crystal clear, really simple, easy to read, easy to understand curriculum in place. Which is why, of course, it leads, bleeds, if you will, right into that next bullet by Darling Hammond, who was, for what it's worth, Obama's initial pick for Secretary of Education and his advisor during his first campaign. How many of you think? <laughs> A good curriculum, a good, clear, defensible curriculum would really make any teacher way better than they currently are. Man, would it have ever helped me my first few years of teaching. And viable. If you reduce down to the most essential, it creates more time for three things which some people would say are the heart and soul of education. Reading and writing and talking or discussing. That's why Marzano says, look, it's, you know, education science is, is inexact, like, like most sciences, okay? But he came to the conclusion, based on his meta-analyses, if you look at all the different studies, there's a darn good chance this is the number one, I'm gonna hold up a finger to emphasize this, number one factor that ensures that the largest swath of our students gets an education they can take into the future and bank on. So if it's that big a deal, if it's that big a deal, we ought to kind of define it. Look here. I want you to look up there. Raise your hand if you can pretty much go with that definition. Something like that. Raise your hand if that's pretty close to what makes sense. I've got a whole a lot of you. Thinking, yes, yeah, that makes sense. Notice it doesn't say all. Doesn't say the exact same order, doesn't say daily scripted lessons, it just says there ought to be a hefty chunk of that curriculum that we teach in common, okay? Now, if you go with that, if you go with that, I'm gonna suggest that during the time after I'm done here and you go off to talk with each other, revisit that definition and ask yourself, how close does our current curriculum, our current curriculum work, come to that kind of curriculum? Because that, that is the beginning of a guaranteed and viable curriculum, and it might look, might look kind of like that. Look up there. Just pretend you're a new social studies teacher. Math would look slightly different. There's, in math, there's a little more emphasis on just these two columns. My wife's high school in uh, Tempe Union, Tempe High School in Tempe Union High School District in Arizona, all they did they had terribly low scores. All they did was attend to these two things and laid out a curriculum for the whole year in algebra, geometry, et cetera, at the high school level. Guess what happened? In a two-year period, they had, they were one of three schools that made the biggest gains in the state in math. And I went to the awards ceremony at the central office. It was quite something gratifying. But all I'm saying is, 
Would you? How many of you? You know, Dan Lord, how many of you were a new teacher one time in your life? <laughs> I, I ask that because think back to when you were a new teacher. A guy named Dan Lordy said about the third or fourth week of school, you know what you realize? Is that despite your fears and anxiety, oh gosh, the curriculum, well, I teach it well, you realize about the fourth week of school, there is no curriculum. Did you hear what I said? Almost every teacher in America kind of exhales, and right behind that comes this anxiety like, what the hell do I do? And he said, teachers don't realize it, but they love that initial jolt, that little, you know, uh, freedom. And then they realize, I crave this. How many of you wish that for most weeks, not every week, but most weeks, you had something akin to this given to you by the department? Would you not like to have that? Something like that? That's what we need to build. And this is another slide I would ask you to revisit during your time where you're talking to each other and try to make productive use of today and this morning. Look at your own curriculum. Is it that neat, clean, and clear? Um, maybe I'll have a chance to talk to you about this in a little more detail when we circulate. Now, all this said, if this is really the number one factor, or at least possibly the number one factor, turn to each other for just 10 seconds and answer that question just as honestly as you can with your friends in the seats here, if you would please. And as much as I would love to let that conversation go, I would just want to ask you three and two and one. Could I ask you a softball question? How many of you think you've still got a ways to go? Still got a ways to go. Okay. If so, if every one of my audiences, I'm not exaggerating, everyone except maybe one high school in California that I know, 90% or somewhere in that, that range, of the hands go up. That means there's a huge opportunity here, and uh, you're in pretty good company. Look at the research, and I don't mean some research. Every research study ever done comes to the following conclusions. Yes? It's the world I grew up in, uh, and I'm still living in it. I think we all are, most of us. Now, this, all this bad news, you think, oh gosh, gee whiz, uh, what do we do? How many of you know a guy named Dick Fosbury? Know the name? He's the guy who invented Fosbury Flop. Fosbury Flop. That's right, meaning you jump over the bar backwards. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's this kid, he's 15, 16, walks up to the coach and says, hey, can I try this new way to jump over the bar? Coach says, you go right ahead, son. And he does it, and in a, in a sport where that much of a gain for a day is pretty good, he makes a six inch gain in two hours, six inches. Now at that point, every track team, every high jumper, I should say, in the country was in the perfect position, the perfect conditions obtained for there to be not just fast, but huge gains. And what were those conditions? That they did not do the Fosbury flop. Anyone who did not do best practice in 1965, I believe it was, was just about poised to make a huge and immediate gain. Now what institution or organization or is in just such a position? Is education in a position to make fast, large gains? Well, you could believe me or not, and I could line the walls with research Every research study shows that the most powerful, simple practices are the ones we do the least. I want to say that again. We work in a system that almost guarantees that we adopt new stuff, innovations, cutting edge this, that, the other thing, and ignore the stuff that matters the most. What would happen if we stopped 
doing. There's another Jim Collins term. Stop doing the stuff that doesn't work but looks cool, like differentiated instruction. And adopted the stuff that really does work. Well, something pretty cool. As you've seen, what would happen? I mean, you have to ask yourself, what would happen if, we, if everybody really crafted a clear, coherent curriculum? And here's number two, and frankly, it's part of curriculum. You don't have curriculum until it's rich with reading, writing, and speaking opportunities. We take those away, you don't have a curriculum. It's a full curriculum. Look up here, and feel free to read and share a thought or two with your friends as you look at these. These are a big deal. True. How many of you buy into what you just saw? You, I mean, in your in your bones, don't you know? There's so much truth there, and yet, as Richard Allington likes to point out, why does this stuff overwhelm the authentic literacy? This is what we do instead of having kids read and write and discuss. I guess teach, folks. Uh, you know, a couple times a year. One of the things I'm always struck by because I take the kids through a reading, a discussion, and a writing exercise, all in one, about the same article. Okay. The thing I'm struck by is when I call on kids randomly, have them pair up or whatever, I can tell they're so unused to discussion, they look down at their desks, they mumble something, they speak in half sentences. When they do talk, they use words like, 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 you know, and he's all, that kind of stuff, in such a way that I can tell they're not used to having discussions. Can you imagine anything more unfortunate for kids? By the time they're not typically teaching old seventh and eighth grade, they haven't been taught how to do these things. What's wrong with the system that, that we're victims of? Whatever's wrong with it, I think we're in a position to change it. Look at the stuff that goes on. I'm not saying you never, ever, ever show a movie clip, or maybe once a year show a movie, but uh, how many days does a typical teacher use to show a movie in an English social studies science class? If it's, if it's a full movie, about four days. About four days. Well, we gotta rethink that, don't we? And how about this stuff here? How about this stuff here? You know a guy named Frederick Douglass? You know how he learned to read? He wasn't supposed to learn to read. It was illegal for blacks to, to learn to read. So he had to, on the sly, pay his fellow dock boys part of his lunch, and they taught him to decode, and then he just did the rest himself. Can you imagine if those kids said, well, first of all, I'm gonna teach you about rising action. <laughs> okay, this is one of the story. Or how about, when you guys pick up the paper, how many of you pick up the paper and go, okay, baby, I'm a, I'm a good reader. I'm gonna find that main idea. <laughs> no, one, no one does that. You know, they found nobody reads for main idea. It's a proxy. It's a proxy that may be a necessary evil of testing. Don't teach kids main idea. You know, the best schools would never teach this stuff. All they do is ask kids lots of inferential, higher order questions about what they read, and then they discuss, and then they write. And then they read something else, and then they discuss it, and then they write. That's all they do, and they knock the socks off of these standardized tests. I'm in a, I'm in a coffee shop in uh, Tempe, Arizona, and there's these two girls talking about their uh, English teacher, and I said, I'll give you 10 bucks each and I'll buy your coffee, just give me five minutes. Well, they gave me 15. Here's what I found out. They did no writing that in any way resembled anything like what they'd need for college. Number two, they only read two books, quote unquote, read two books. They didn't have to because they just did exactly what my daughters did in high school. They sat in groups for, whoops, who put this here? Hey, <laughs> sorry. They sat in groups for five days with five-page worksheets with loads of questions on them, and they just share. Like, Pam, did you get to, what color was Calpurnia's tie, uh, Calpurnia's shoes, her dress in chapter five? Oh, got it. Okay, what about Atticus? What, did he this or that? Okay, got it. You're just swapping these and shooting the bull, and at the end of five days, you turn it in. Kids didn't even read it. Then I said, did you watch the, think they did? Of course they did. How many days? Four days, fifth day, what they do? Kind of said, oh, in the book they did this, and in the movie they did that, and oh, ha, 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 wasn't that fun? And there was two weeks, and they did stuff, they did other stuff, too. They did other stuff. Nothing having to do with, and they're just about to go out the door, and one of them said, blah, 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 Odyssey. I said, oh, did you read the Odyssey? Because a lot of ninth graders, ninth and tenth graders, read the Odyssey. And they said, well, we didn't read it, but we read a summary. Oh, and we saw the movie. I said, 
the movie? Is there a good movie on the Odyssey? Well, it's actually, it was, it was, it was uh, Old Brother, Where Art Thou? <laughs> now you laugh, and uh, bless your heart, you know, you would groan, and we, oh my goodness. How many of you know, this is as common as clay in public schools. Do you know this? this I'm, not, I'm not sure, this was Honors English. This is Honors English. This is, this is a rare, this kind of stuff goes on all over the place because we don't have, what, a curriculum. And we don't understand literacy, which ought to be, believe this or not, I only have time to give you the very, very short version. This is what, guess who wrote this? Let me turn that around. Look up there, take that in, got it? Now look at this one, they kind of overlap, don't they? Hmm? And this one. Now, Schmoker and Yeager, that's just an article that explains what I'm about to tell you. It's not original. It's just Carol Yeager is a former, you should know this, she's the former president of the National Council of Teachers of English. She's an author, 25 year English teaching veteran, and she and I wrote to say this is what you need to pay attention to not your grade by grade standards for the Common Core or any state test, because guess who wrote these and said, don't look at those grade by grade standards? We ourselves didn't want people to use it. The architects of the Common Core, David Coleman, Susan Pimentel. Look it up, look it up. Or just put Schmoker and Yego in your Google and you'll find that article when we explain it. Now what does that mean? It means, and I, and I would encourage you to look at that last slide in your uh, sessions after, after this morning, after I'm done, and this one. And just ask, ask yourselves this. If this is a, and it is, believe me, this is a typical representative item from the new wave, you know this, of tests for English language arts, right? This isn't the old, just what's the main idea, internal, external, public. There's a whole lot more of this. I have to give credit to the Common Core for upping the ante and coming closer to real world literacy. Lots of, I have lots of complaints, no time for that. This is it. I just, I just beg you to consider what sets of skills are necessary for a kid to be able to read those and then write a decent response to that question at the bottom. And just to put it crudely, which, which article or piece makes the best arguments? Couldn't it be reduced to that? It could, it could. Now I just want to tease, tease this out of you a little bit, just to prime the pump. And if you want, after I'm done, you can talk about how can we make sure every teacher masters just four or five core skills? Wouldn't one of them be, you gotta be able to go through those articles and listen to me, underline stuff that might support an ar you know, your arguments in the essay? How many of you think, yeah, you gotta teach kids to do that? But then it's not enough, is it? Then you gotta teach them how to do what with those, oh, sorry, even next, they got 15 things underlined. How many of you think that's too many? Darn right it's too many. So you gotta teach them to do what? Got 15 quotes, can't use them all. They've underlined all this pretty good stuff, but how many of you think there's something that has to be taught there? You gotta move from that 15 to, I don't know, fewer? How many of you think you have to teach the kids how to make those selections? And once you've got them down to, I don't know, six or eight, then you've gotta, if something else comes in there. Every one of us did this when we completed college papers. We had to learn to organize, put them in a certain order, yes? Do kids need to be taught these things? I'll stop there. You finish it. I guarantee you, there's only five or six skills here. They're just as ordinary as could be. And the moment every teacher, I think every teacher, just knows how to do those five pieces reasonably well, and this is something you might talk about after we're done here today, we're going to see a revolution in college preparation because, according to David Connolly, who did the most exhaustive study ever done on preparation for college, Learning those five or six things that would respond to kid, would help a kid respond to that kind of an item, or just to write, here's what he found. Any kid that can write a decent five-page paper, not dazzling, just a decent five-page paper with a bibliography, could probably get through and get a degree from about two-thirds of the four-year colleges in the United States. That's how big a deal it is. And the asterisk is there just to... Just to remind you, there's an article you can see on Google, it's not my work, but I've collected it, called Write More, Grade Less. It's how you can do buku writing and writing instruction without being a slave to paper grading. And I'd just like to mention Cheryl Sandberg, who said, why did we only write one five-page paper in high school? I went to a 
high-performing, suburban, affluent school. We only wrote one five-page paper. When I got to college, which, what happened to her? She had these assignments coming at her right, left, and sideways. Now, this last piece might be as far as I get, because I hate going over time. I just want to show you, you guys know Harry Wong? All right, now, you take this in, just take this in, reject it if you like, taking my shoe off for a reason, believe me. Harry Wong said, once asked, somebody said, well, well, what's the best school district you ever saw? And he said, oh, it'd have to be the Flowing Well School District. Well, the Flowing Well School District was right next to the district I taught, I worked in. We were the cutting edge district, meaning our scores, everything flatlined. Flowing Well is one of the most successful, most successful school districts in the history of the state. And I don't, I'm not recommending this. But they only did one thing, and it was one of the three things that we talked about, and the teachers were evaluated this way, and I gotta throw this in too. I worked at a, at a school in a different district down the way, did the, the same thing that Flowing Wells did, plus some other things, and it was just this. We were taught how to do the following. And this is how we were evaluated. This was literally our evaluation. There was a few other kind of unspoken extras, but this was the core, and am I recommending that you use it? I am. You may, not, you may not go with that, but I'm strongly urging that you consider the following. You would make sure, we had to make sure when we were teaching that every kid was looking at us when we talked. When we said, okay, try something now, every kid had to be at work. Is this possible for normal human being teachers? It is, it is, and there's a handful of strategies that go with it. So the next thing is, now, getting kids to be attention, part of it's just doing things like stopping and saying, okay, I want all eyes up here. I'm waiting on a few of you. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on four of you. How many of you know the strategy? I'm waiting on two of you. Thank you. Now, if they persist in not paying attention in Arizona, we can, we can tase kids. <laughs> You've got to do other stuff in Washington because you're a little more enlightened than we were. I wish I had a better place to put this. Anyway, you can sort of kind of see my shoe here, can't you? I, I want to make this as simple as possible and be the last thing I can talk about here. First, you've got to have a clear learning objective. I can tie my shoe, right? Anticipatory set. There's any number of things you could say to talk a kid into thinking, hey, this is useful knowledge, all right? When you give that anticipatory set, it changes the whole tenor of the lesson and makes way more kids pay attention than if you don't. We know this. Then you start to model. Should we model in small or large chunks if we want every kid to get it? Small, small. So if I'm teaching you like this, I'll have to do it like this on my lap, do you mind? So here we go. I'm teaching like this, and I say, okay, kids, let's presume I can see all your little shoes in front of you. I say, okay, guys, first thing I want you to do is, here's the first chunk. Take the laces between your thumb and forefinger, and then take the right lace, let it drop over to the left, and then take the left, what's wrong with my lesson? And then take this left lace, put it under here, what's wrong with this lesson, folks? And then take the left lace here and pull, then take the, what's wrong with it? Too fast, too many. How many chunks did I just blow through? Count, out loud. Well, that, that's as far as we'll get, okay? And just say, okay, so how should we do this? After I do this, this is modeling, right? And forgive me. The next thing you do after you model, and we don't get this yet. Folks, I know this sounds elementary, but I'm telling you, teachers don't realize the minute they say, here's how you do something, the absolute sine qua non for the kids is that they have to what? Do the same thing. They have to engage in guided practice. And it's guided because while they're doing it, what are we doing? We're checking our email. <laughs> No, we're checking for understanding. And in this case, the check is a pretty simple one. I just modeled, this is just one chunk. Every chunk deserves this whole cycle. I model how to hold the laces, that's enough. And then I, and then I say, now you guys do it. That's your guided practice. And while you're doing it, I'm checking by looking. And I look at it, I look at it, I go, oh yes, yes, not quite, no. And then I see, oh gee, you know, some of them are holding the laces way down here. Is that a problem? It is. So what do I got to do? I have to, what's the word? Starts with an R. See, we all know this stuff. It's obvious, isn't it? We reteach, sorry. We re, well, there we go. We reteach, 
And we do that for every step. And there's about eight steps there, folks. And at the end, when we can see that all the kids succeeded on each chunk, you hear what I'm saying? Every kid, or virtually every kid, except for, say, you two, bless your hearts. You look great today, by the way. <laughs> These two kids are the only ones who didn't get it. Guess when I can give them special additional attention? During the independent practice. That's how you teach good lessons. Good lessons take about half the period, 25-ish minutes. You go through it just like that. What kind of impact will that have? And I know I'm probably stealing time right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want you to know that the three things I picked, I picked very carefully. You teach like this, and the evidence is overwhelming that you will change the course of a kid's life. If you accompany with literacy and good curriculum, take a look at some of that data up there. Just last little bit, I know a teacher, Flagstaff, Arizona, I was invited to watch him teach. His name was Sean Connors. I go in and all I did was teach like that. For one period, he taught for about 25 minutes, taught the kids how to write introductory paragraphs. At the end of that one 50-ish minute period, every kid in there knew how to put a nice three-part introductory paragraph together. Everyone except one kid who needed a little extra attention and got it during the independent practice. At that school, the, this is Coconino High School in Flagstaff, Arizona. They were by far the most demographically challenged. They went from third to first in the city, just in writing, just throwing the socioeconomic factor out the window. Even better than that, on the exit exam, when there was true exit exams in Arizona, the percentage of kids passing the writing exam went from 59%, get that, to 85. It was the largest gain in the state. When they looked at the data, there was nine members of the English department. 90% of the gain came from one person, Sean Connors. That's what the data showed. And I watched him teach three times, and he was not a genius, and he was not charismatic. He just taught like that. Three things I talked about. A very simple model of literacy, curriculum, and instruction, most of which we're fairly familiar with. If we do those things and not much else, we will have stunningly powerful consequences within a school year if we actually do them. Absolutely within two if we get a bit of a slow start. I'm done and I think I went over time and I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Okay, um, we do have a plan for us to go and do some debriefing in our next session. I'm going to push a pause, and uh, we do want to come back around this morning. We have another announcement that's very important that we want to make, and I'm going to let Dr. Watts step up and uh, make that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hansing. And Thank you, Dr. Smoker. Just a, uh, a few announcements to our leaders. And again, I do apologize. I want to extend our welcome to our newest uh, principal team members and those who may be experienced principals serving in different locations or new to the role. When I call your name, would you please stand and be recognized and we'll give a one Astounding round of applause at the very end. Uh, Heidi Maurer. Heidi, currently serving as principal at Cedar Heights, will be serving as new principal at Kent Lake High School. Please stand and remain standing. We can give her a round of applause now. And Why don't we change the script? We'll give it applause and then you can be recognized and you can be comfortable and have a seat. How about that, <laughs> right? Next, Dana Steiner. Dana, current assistant principal, East Hill will be serving as principal of Pine Tree Elementary School. Welcome, welcome, thank you. Eric Quima, 
Eric will be serving and has been, yes, you can give him a round of applause now and uh, get out of Eric has gone, uh, again, as these others have, uh, approved and before the board as interim principal at Meadow Ridge uh, Elementary School, and we look forward to continued work in that area and supporting the work that continues at Meadow Ridge. Congratulations, Eric. Give him a round of applause. Heidi Lindquist Lane, assistant principal at Springbrook. Heidi, wave, wave your hand. There you go. Congratulations and welcome. Josh Ed, excuse me, Josh Edson. Where are you, Josh? Yes, Josh. You can stay standing. He's joining now the team at Kent Ridge as assistant principal, formerly served at Kent Phoenix Academy. Welcome and congratulations, Josh. Bridget McKinnon Schrodel. Bridget, assistant principal at Park Orchard, previously serving at Life Fortune. Congratulations, Bridget. Welcome. Patrick O'Connor, principal at Park Orchard. Has been named before. We want to make sure we recognize you. Thank you, Patrick, for your work. Julie Moore, is no stranger to the Department of Inclusive Education, now serving as assistant director in the Inclusive Education Department. Congratulations to you. Mr. Ricardo Robles, Assistant Principal, Kent Meridian High School. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And David Lutz. Dave, spirit is here. There we go, in and true. <laughs> Director of Athletics and Activities. Congratulations to all. We look forward to our continued leadership and learning. Well, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Onsen. Okay, so we will be um, going on a break now. We'll, have, we'll take a 15 minute break and we'll cut the time off our Schmoker small group uh, a little bit there. Um, but you will, here's what we'd like you to do. The leadership advisory really wanted to give you an opportunity to debrief and talk with each other and process right now all that stuff that Dr. Schmoker just presented to, to us, right? And so we want to use the questions that he provided in his handout. And if you got your handouts at the desk today when you came in, this is the one you're going to need. It looks like this, okay? So these are some of the slides that he referred to, and it's got the questions on them that we're going to be using in our Schmoker small groups. You're say, well, how do I know where to go to my Schmoker small group? Say that one fast three times. <laughs> okay, so what you're going to do is Tracy Phillips right there, which I introduced this morning and said a grand thank you. Here she is. It's your opportunity now to say thank you for all that great work you did today. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> so you're going to pick up a room number from the basket and then go to the room number that you draw. At the end of our 15 minute break, we're gonna meet back in there. And then you're gonna have that next whatever 45 minutes or so to talk about those questions in, in your randomized groups. So no, we didn't assign groups. You're gonna pick a number and go to that. Um, and then there's gonna be chart paper and markers in each of the rooms. If you wanna use those to capture your th thoughts, please do. Dr. Watts and Dr. Schmoker, here's the cool part, they're gonna be rotating around and joining in on our small groups. So awesome that we're gonna have that opportunity to interact and engage as well. So we will go now to our break, get your number, we'll go to our break, we'll uh, go to our small groups, and then we'll come back in the, in the Commons for a morning wrap up at 11.40 before we start our afternoon breakout sessions um, and such. All right, you're on break. Thank you so much.